use a White House where I wait in our line with a lot of other bills for the president to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be along. I hope and pray that he will. But today I am still just a bill. You mean even... Welcome back. Part three of the CUNE Academy, where we're building responsible voters one video at a time. All right, we're going to wrap up this How a Bill Becomes a Law segment. You kind of saw some excerpts of Schoolhouse Rock, and feel free to watch the whole segment there, and you can actually a uh, nice review from your grade school days. Okay, so after a bill is passed the House and the Senate, but it's a different version, okay, then it's going to go to a conference committee. We saw this most recently with the health care bill passed a couple years ago, a.k.a. Obamacare. Um, the House passed a version that was pretty stringent, pretty... Um, liberal, um, had a public option in it, which would allow the um, government to provide health care for, or be a health care provider, essentially, which could possibly put the insurance companies out of business. Um, it also um, banned funding of abortions, for example, uh, and then um, federal funding of abortions. And then the Senate version passed, which looked totally different. So normally it would have went to a conference committee, but because of the filibuster threat, they had to do a little goofy thing called demon pass has nothing to do with anything we need to learn in class. Um, it's a little procedural quirk that they were able to do to get things done. How it is supposed to work is they form a conference committee with members of both chambers present. Okay. Now, if there is unified government, meaning when the House and the Senate are of the same party, sometimes they skip the conference committee. It just goes right to the majority leader and the Speaker of the House, and they will negotiate and work out the conference and then send it back. Um, the fiscal cliff bill from last Christmas that you might have heard about, uh, that was done kind of the same way. You had Joe Biden and the minority leader working together um, with the, uh, the Speaker of the House, and they were able to get some things done that way. So um, it kind of works informally that way, or it goes more formal with the conference committee. Okay, uh, The conference committee negotiates. They work out deals. A lot of times this is when pork gets thrown in, some extra riders and amendments to make sure it's going to please all the powers that need to uh, approve the bill. And then they prepare a written conference report that's going to get submitted back to each chamber. Okay, now this does not have to go through the whole process again. It doesn't go to a committee, subcommittee, and all that stuff. The, the chamber as a whole votes on the conference bill whether they're going to pass it or not. Okay, um, and most of the times that works out, it passes, and, um, and then it goes to the president. So sometimes if they can't work out a deal, then the bill just dies because both houses cannot reach agreement. Okay, but that just gets voted on up or down, uh, but it can be filibustered. The conference report has to be approved by the House and the Senate, as I mentioned. Okay, simple majority in the House and usually the filibuster hurdle in the Senate. Then it goes on to the president. Okay, there are four options that, uh, that happens when it gets to the president. Okay, he can sign it. If he signs it, it becomes law. It's all good. Everybody's dancing on the steps of the Capitol. Game over. Usually a president will have a symbolic ceremony someplace. Uh, an immigration bill is going to be signed at the Statue of Liberty. Uh, a jobs bill is going to be signed in some factory plant. You know, they just want to get some publicity and some good camera pictures and stuff for them. Um, if he does not sign it within 10 days, but Congress is in session, so Congress is still there, they're still doing their jobs, and the president doesn't sign it, then it automatically becomes the law. He doesn't have to sign it. Now, the fiscal cliff bill, something interesting about that one, when that one was passed, uh, President Obama used the auto pen to sign it. He was in Hawaii on his Christmas vacation, and he contacted his chief of staff and said, I signed the bill, use the auto pen, and it passes. So that's a great example of an informal amendment to our Constitution where um, social change and customs have, have uh, evolved to the point where the president um, has a machine sign it for him. And the constitutional scholars actually looked into that to see if the Constitution would allow it, and they said that that does count uh, using the auto pen. Bush started the trend, and Obama's doing the same thing. Um, now, if the president doesn't like the bill, it becomes vetoed. All right, He says, no, the bill is dead, and it takes two-thirds of both houses to override that veto. Okay. Right now, I believe President Obama has vetoed two bills in um, s almost six years as president. Okay. Now, why does that happen? Because the first couple of years, he had all Democrats in control of both houses. He's not really going to veto anything that comes from his own party. And then now when you have a House and a Senate that are of different parties, usually they're not going to agree on anything to pass to send to them, and the few things they do are more than likely things that he wants done anyway. So that's why he has had so few. Andrew Johnson, Gerald Ford, they had a ton of vetoes, and a ton of vetoes overridden. Okay, The War Powers Act was overridden by a two-thirds vote in both the House and Senate. So the override does happen, 
not too often though. And then the fourth thing that's kind of thrown in there, so we got sign it, we got wait 10 days, we got veto. The fifth thing the president can do is do a pocket veto, which means he has not signed the bill, but Congress is going to go out of session. Their term expires, they go home, and uh, the bill is automatically dead, and it has to be reintroduced in the new session. Okay, So the pocket veto only applies when Congress's term expires within 10 days of the bill's passage. So essentially, not a lot's going to get done within those last 10 days that's going to be controversial because they know the president can just walk away and it's automatically pocket vetoed okay you also should know about a line item veto we're going to cover that more in the executive chapter coming up in chapter eight all right that's something that doesn't exist but certain groups of people tea party people uh, fiscal hawks as we call them they want to um, bring the line item veto back because it will reduce some spending all right so that concludes how a bill becomes a law thank you for listening to the cune academy and we are building responsible voters one video at a time and remember politics is not a spectator sport thank you very much have a great weekend